Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Kyle. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> it's not very convincing. When... Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm um, I'm getting better as I go. Give Which me, I found... Give me five minutes. Yeah, yeah. I found <laughs> that um, interesting because as you, you know, you, you and your industry and doing what you do with martial arts, mm. you do interviews all the time, mm. but... Um, what we're here to do today is kind of unpack a little bit for anybody watching mm. the whole journey of recovery and and uh, recovery being that umbrella statement when you know we hit and it's never usually one time it's an accumulation of events that we kind of feel like hang on a minute I need to do a U-turn or I'm not being my best self and mm. you and I both being parents I think you when you've got little people well my boys aren't so little anymore but they're still always watching you mm. and if we want to mentor our kids we kind of got to try and be the best version of ourselves but it's a lifelong bloody journey isn't it yeah it is and i think it's the um i think it's the the influence over the authority that i think we've spoken about before that you know like you can't you can't tell your children to do something that you're not trying to do yourself mm. and i think um there is maybe a lot of parents out there that are unable to be comfortable making themselves vulnerable to then go I'm okay to do this. So like I said to you today, it was a good thing for me because it's putting out there that, you know, with what I do in my circle, it's it's okay to, to talk like this and do this stuff, but then also it's okay for your children to come and talk to you like this. And, you know, we all we all have our story, so it's, it's it needs to be shared, I think. And I think, you know, when we first met and we started to talk about the whole recovery journey, you know, I mean, I... The universe tends to bring me a lot of gladiators, mm. a lot of men that have, you know, and, you know, your story's been very much, you know, gladiators being men that are often hardwired to provide, protect, patrol the boundaries. And mm. you've been, you know, you've worked with musicians and been the bouncers and run security teams. Yeah. And now, you know, you've got your own business in martial arts. Tell me again, I know um, that, that symbol around your neck. For people no. that don't know your industry, maybe just give us, walk us through, you know, your history. Um, yeah. So uh, I've been doing martial arts now for nearly 30 years. Um, uh, I'll get to that. Um, I started when I was um, 19 working in hotels and nightclubs and that graduated to work in security and concerts and festivals and bands and all sorts of things and the whole time doing martial arts as well. Um, and it is it is a circle where you have to very often put on a, an exterior. Um, because, what sort of exterior? Well, I think you have to put on that you are like how you, I, I, how you use the term gladiator. I'm put the like, armour on. Well, you do. And I think it's it's funny, like, you know, how we, um, how we had the conversation coming here and I um, I emailed you on the weekend and said, I've got a black eye at the moment. <laughs> Is that okay? I sat back and I thought about that and I went, I think that's actually probably really good that I have a black eye because it's funny in the last few days I've had so many comments about it um, because oh, we just we just don't expect you to, to have that, you know, and I said, I'm because you're at the top of the tree in the martial arts. You're well, kind of right. one of the I masters. Mean, you know, like, and I'm, I'm not, ex you know, and it's great in a way because it shows that I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not Superman, you know, and I'm, I'm still very good at. So know. somebody contacted. Yeah, it was like it's just a stray knee, just doing some jujitsu, and it just, it, it happens. It's just one of those things, and I think, you know, it's funny. Like when the kid hit me, and he, and he is a kid. He's like, I think, 21, 22. He was like, oh, it's cool, man. It just it, it happens. It's just one of those things. And I think that's, you know, I'll be honest, there would have been a time where I would have walked away and kind of beat myself up about that again. And then on Friday night, I hurt my knee. We're Same getting thing. older. I we? know. <laughs> I know. It's just like, and I'm just going, ah. Oh. But uh, how'd you hurt your knee? Oh, just again, jujitsu, just, and uh, the, um, the student who hurt it, um, He's like going, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm just, it just, it happens, man. You know, it's, it's my fault, you know, and I just, now I keep going and moving forward. But I guess the um, the crosses um, that we have, so this is the, the martial arts that I do is, um, one of the martial arts is Zendo Kai. So these are called- Say that again, Zendo- Zendo Kai. Does it translate to mean anything? It means the best of everything in progression. 
Oh, wow. How yeah. cool is that? I know. So it's pretty cool. And it's a progressive martial art. It's been going for 50 years next year, um, Australian born and bred. Um, the crosses are basically, it's a symbol of our brotherhood together. So um, the Bushido cross, as it's called, or the protector cross, you know. Oh, wow. It's funny, the yeah. English equivalent. It yeah. all relates back to what we discuss. Yeah. I um, I look at it now a lot differently. There was a time where, you know, to get these crosses, it wasn't about, you know, how good a fighter you were or anything. It was about your your bond that you had with your people. Um, now the way I look at it is I guess you'd say it's almost like a social thing for me. Like it's not about, you know, I give people crosses now not based on how hard they can punch and kick or anything like that. It's, I guess, the relationship we have and what it means to us and I guess how upfront we are with each other. I think um, this probably means more to me in the past couple of years than it ever has before um, for a number of reasons and stuff we've spoken about, but I think it's just that that bond, you know, and like you say, we have the gladiators and, you know, friends of mine are gladiators as well. But I think in this day and age, we have to be gladiators, but still, you know, show our wives and our children and our friends that it's okay to, I guess, basically not be a gladiator every single day. Well, you use that word vulnerability and, and you know, I think I might have mentioned to you, I, I did a a, a workshop down in Melbourne for a code of footballers and it was called Gladiators and Gentlemen because mm. it's it's and the gentleman being that connected, sensitive, you know, vulnerable, you know, because without vulnerability there's no intimacy and mm. when we're bringing up children and we've got a, you know, a great love in our life that, you know, you the, the, the greatest loves are where you are safe to be vulnerable and the, the, the beauty, one of the most beautiful things I think about, you know, uh, men is their capacity to be sensitive and reverse, you know, for females, one of the most wonderful things to see in a female is her capacity to stand up and be strong and provide and protect for herself. And I think that makes us the whole package. Yeah, I definitely think. And I think this the stigma, the stigma is unfortunately still there. I think in the last 10 years, it's really gone down a lot. Um, but just that ability for men in particular, no matter what they do, like, you know, I remember us having discussions about, you know, defence personnel and the definition of courage and, you know, mm. without you can't show courage unless at some point you're willing to be vulnerable. Mm. And, I mean, we see it in martial arts a lot, like, you know, especially our, our gladiators. There is sometimes that point where some of us get to that, like we're not willing to put ourselves out there a little bit in order to continue to move forward. It's like I've said to you, I, you know, I'm a black belt in jiu-jitsu and I have coloured belts that roll with me that have been, you know, training with me a third of the time. And sometimes they'll get me and I just go, that's that's cool. That's good. You know, it, it, but there would have been a time where that would have been, you know, a real... Do you reckon it's, it's a Hana kind of high five moment for them? Oh, they well, got you? I reckon a lot of the time... God, I got him. Yeah, and a lot of the time they're like, ah. Oh. But, I mean, these days I would have, you know, I would have gone to the point of having, you know, almost getting injured so as not to get tapped out. Now I just go, because I've, you know, I've got stuff on my body that's not working as well as it should be. And I go now, it's, it's just like, yeah. Self preservation kicks in. Live to fight another day. Yeah, yeah. You've got a business to run, you've got kids, yeah, you've got and a that's wife. It. Like, you know, yeah. now I look at it, you know, it's, it's, you know, if I, if I can't, you know, run around with my kids or I can't go and do what I want to do with my kids, because, you know, I think that sort of, that sort of stuff now is, is way more important to me and I think, you know, it's it's okay to be strong and, and tough and all the rest of it, but I think you have to understand that there's times where it's okay to drop that down. Mm. And, I'll, you know, I'm a father of two daughters and I when my, um, when my second daughter was born, mates of mine, knowing my background and knowing what I do, went, oh, don't you want a son? And I went, no, no, I'm pretty happy having two girls, mm. you know, and if you meet my daughters, they, they switch. Between they can hold their own, they, can't they? They, they? they train with you. They do their thing. And yeah. I think um, I think that's okay to have that, you know, have that understanding and your girls can see that not only, like, the mother is, you know, supportive but also, you know, dad has bad days and dad will have a chat to you and tries to put mm. things in perspective. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's important.
I'd be interested on your take um, from where I sit working with clients over the last couple of decades and, you know, the, the irony of this very pink womb-like room that I purposely orchestrate with fairy lights and it's, you know, it's drenched in feminine energy. Mm. And I find the universe sends me more and more gladiatorial men that are kind of, they come in with their armour on and they're battled and bruised. And it's almost like they need a place, a soft place to take their armour off and have a look at perhaps wounds that were there before they put their armour on. Mm. Now, I'd be interested in your take. I mean, there are, you know, I mean, there is, you know, and I'm not interested in pretending we know everything, but it's just in observations, you know, there some of the men I observe, and you know, when I'm working with the defence forces, or I'm working with elite athletes, and men like yourself that come to me, you know, in a stage in their life where they're, you know, they're a bit battle weary, and the heart needs a bit of a reboot. Mm. Um, what I tend to observe, and sometimes the bigger, the more muscular, the more heavily tattooed the man. No, I don't want to talk. To, <laughs> well, the tribal markings are very important on men and women, you know, and, yeah. and tribal markings, you know, this day and age are, are becoming beautiful artwork. Yeah. And, and most people, you know, regardless of their gender, when you ask them about a tattoo, they'll tell you the story, yeah, a story. of that chapter and what that means of claiming that dimension or even just for decorative beauty or whatever, mm. just for joy, whatever it is. It has a meaning for that person. And there's a, there's a, it, it, it's interesting now, um, you know, when I, you know, I'm 57 this year. So when I was growing up, girls with tattoos, it meant something different. Now, you know, I find it fascinating to be able to sit with young women and ask them about their tattoos. It's a very interesting thing. But getting back to that, um, I can't help but think that sometimes when I look at these, these men, I think, okay, often when there's an overcompensation, mm. and I will tell you I see it in some of my female clients that are doing body sculpting or that are personal trainers, tra trainers and these women are rock hard. I mean, they are impressive athletes. But more often than not, if, if they're coming to me, we unpack a child that was powerless mm. at some point in form. Now, powerless, sometimes that can mean powerless over a tragic event, the death of a parent, mm. um, powerless being sent to a boarding school where there were bullies, powerless over domestic violence, sexual assault, some kind of emotive event where they had no tools. And so without the emotional muscle and skill sets, often what they do in adolescence is think, well, I will just get myself as physically strong as possible so that, and, and sometimes, not for all people, but for sometimes I do have clients that have said to me, you know, that have amazing tattoos all over their body. And basically I've, I've had both males and females say this because some tattoos are beautiful with florals and some are devil's faces mm. and guns and whatever. And a couple of clients have said, well, my tattoos speak for me. And they just say, fuck off, keep away. Mm. You know, don't fucking come near me. Mm. I'm a warrior and I will come for you. And it, 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 it's a form of armour. Mm. Um, again, you know, there are varieties of different reasons. But I'm interested, you know, because now, you know, in your career, you know, you're a teacher and we will put up at the end of this um, clip you know, Kyle's address, his website, for anyone that's got questions or anything they'd li like to ask. But I suppose, double laid question here, do you absorb, observe that also being the case? And what was your entree? Why did you get into martial arts? Um, the I'll answer the last question first. I got into martial arts um, because I guess for me, I am... Um, and it was funny because I liked relying. I, I tried team sports as a kid. My brother played team sports and did rather well at them. They just weren't for me. Um, I guess I felt that, you know, I wanted to rely on me and me alone. Um, and my mum had spoken about martial arts. So I'd done other single sports prior to that. And um, martial arts for me was just a way that I wouldn't ever say I was a violent kid. Um, I didn't get in a lot of fights in high school or anything like that, which is, you know, the contrast of what I ended up doing for a career. My mates from high school still talk about it like that's a real jump from what I was in high school. I just, I guess for me, I just, I don't know. It's, it's a hard question to answer. I was, I was just trying to get away. 
Can I ask you, if, and look, if you're not comfortable to talk mm. about it, absolutely, but you know, I am aware that there was a, a major fracturing mm. in your childhood. Do you think that had anything to do with it? Yeah, look, I think, you know, and, and the sessions that we've had have really helped me go back and really analyse things as we've spoken. And I was, it was funny, like I was just listening to something on the way in here um, by a guy called Johan Hari who's written a Isn't book. he amazing? And the, the, section I'm, the section I'm looking at, uh, listening to, is about... Um, depression and sometimes it's from a, like an act of well, an act occurs and you feel like you've betrayed the person or you've let the person down and one thing he uses is the death of a, a parent or the death of a sibling and again yeah my father passed away when I was 10. Can I can I ask you are you comfortable to share because I, I just uh, about uh, at 10 years of age how that happened? Yep um, so and again this is probably leads into it even more. So my father um, was an awesome dude, um, to put it simply. Um, he got called, um, he would get called the Marlborough Man, you know, and that sort of thing. He worked on oil boats and I guess, dare I say it, maybe his, you know, he was 49 um, and he died of a um, fatal heart attack. So at the time he was back in Australia driving taxis and um I went to bed, kissed my dad goodnight, went to bed, um, went to bed with the father, woke up without a father. And I guess for me, the thing, like I was saying, back to Johan Hari stuff, listening to that, it's that thing where, and it's always something that we've spoken about popped up, you know, what if I'd woken up, you know, like, because I slept through the whole thing. If I'd, if I'd woken up, could I have been of any help? Could I have done anything? And I mean, as it turns out, there was nothing anybody could have done. But looking back at it now, and again, us analysing it, maybe the martial arts was a way to try and, you know, and it's, it's funny how you, I think our sessions have been really good at us backtracking. Um, because, yeah, like the job I got into was all about protecting people. And martial arts, I teach people to empower people. Like I'm going overseas in three weeks to teach underprivileged kids how to empower Where themselves. Whereabouts? Dominican Republic. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> but um, it's – so maybe this has all flowed on from, you know, at that point just feeling powerless. So it's like I was listening to Johan stuff, you know, that act of, you know, feeling powerless and then flowing on, you feel, what can I do to move forward? And I guess for us, we've always spoken about, um, you know, the physicality, like you said, the gladiator stuff has mm. always been up here for me. Mm. And dare I say, whether it was a way to try and maybe hide, you know, if I'm, if I'm physically strong and fit and I can do all these other things, I don't have to deal with this as much. And especially over the last, you know, since we've been seeing each other, I've really been working hard on balancing the emotional and everything up so it's level. And I think it's probably as level that it's been. Um, Sorry to interrupt. Hmm. Can, I, <clears throat> can I just ask, do you think that there was something, I mean, it's, it's often said in the psychological instincts that if a father dies, often the oldest son will think he's got to be the hero for mother and step up and provide and protect. And, and the reverse, that if a, if a mother dies, often, you know, the firstborn daughter will try and, you know, learn to cook and just step into mm. that and, and look, you know, and even swap those roles. Do you think that there was anything that kicked in that thought, well, I have to be the man of the house now? Yeah, there was. My mum used to use a term, she used to call us... Um, like it's an old old school thing. She used to call us Darby and Joan um, because my brother was quite older than me, so he wasn't living at home. Um, so it was basically my mother and I, and it and it was hard. Like it was, and you know, speaking to my mother now, um, even just a couple of weeks ago, she talks about you know you you don't really get a chance to grieve. Mm. You had to just, and she has said like, and it was it was a really good conversation we had. She said, you just, everyone sort of will look around and go, oh, geez, you're doing well. Geez, you're going okay. But you just got to get on with it. And yeah, I think yeah. that was something that, you know, I, I had um, 
you know, my, my grandfather passed away when I was 14 and then a really good friend of mine, um, she committed suicide when I was 17. And I distinctly remember being at that girl's funeral and a, a good mate of mine from high school, you know, everyone's bawling and I'm not shedding a tear. And a good friend of mine came up and he said, oh, you're dealing with this really well. And I, it's it's a, just a, a phrase that has just stuck in my head for like, you know, 27 years. And I think looking back and the stuff that we've worked on, maybe even then mm. I still wasn't ready to grieve. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a hard one. Like you, there are those people out there who say you got to get up and get going. But then if if that were ever to occur, you know, if I was to go back and talk to me at 10 years old, I'd say it's okay to just, I saw you just swear before, so I'm going to do it too. It's okay just to lose your shit. Yeah, just yeah. lose your shit, yeah. cry as much as you want, you know. And, again, I remember being like just numb for that first few months. Um and then it was my grandfather, you know, just put his hand on my shoulder one day when we were just talking because he was, he was, again, very good. He was a war veteran. Um, and it was just that moment where it was just like just that we talk about, you know, the comforting and the gladiator. He was probably the gladiator at the time. And he just, I think it was that moment where he just let his guard down and just put his hand on my shoulder and it was just like a switch just went and I just fucking lost it. And I think... Um, How old were you then? Oh, that would have been probably about three or three or so months after. Um, and I had a similar experience with my mum. I remember just sitting at the kitchen table and, yeah, we just, same thing, just bang. It was like, I think it's okay. And, again, this is where you have these people out there that are, you know, and again, dare I say it, I think 90% of them are men that, you know, I'm holding it together for everyone or I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to be, I've got to be strong. You can be strong, but it is okay to just lose your shit every now and then. Mm. You know, God, I'll, now I'll watch a movie and there's like a scene at the end of it, you know, I'm, I'm crying at the end of the Avengers movie. I'm like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> What is wrong with me? I won't give it away, but there, there was really good. Yeah, yeah. Seen it. But, you know, I, I think, you know, being a daughter, you know, and, and thinking of your daughters, I think one of the most, the biggest favours a father does his children. Mm. I was a daughter that grew up with a, a father that was a gladiator and seeing him cry was something that just didn't occur. And mm. I think one of the you know, important things for children to know is that it's safe to cry and it's safe to laugh and it doesn't matter what gender you are. Human beings laugh and cry and they need to grieve and being vulnerable is the privilege, you know, and I think it's interesting you mentioned your, your grandfather and your mother. There have been times where, and it's, you know, often when I have people say, I'm sorry, I'm losing my shit and I go, well, maybe it's the shit you need to lose, you know. Mm. I mean, shit is shit. Let's lose it. Let's hose it off. Mm, totally. You know, because, you know, armour... Um, can kind of just keep you trapped inside. And I think that jo Yona Hari, his, his, what's his name? Is it jo Yona? Yona. Yona Hari. Yona Hari. I, I don't, apologies for saying his name incorrectly, but he's in a brilliant man who talks a lot about addiction and disconnection. Yeah. I don't know if you've, if you've heard that component. He talks about the initial, um, the initial experiment they did with rats in the cage rat on park. addiction and then the rat park. Mm -hmm. For those of you that haven't heard it, just in a, in a nutshell, he talks about the, uh, you know, putting a rat in a cage with two water bottles, one laced with, you know, a drug and one water. And of course, the rat just always tends to choose mm. the laced one. But then they did the experiment years later and put more than one rat in the cage and put it rat Disneyland in the cage. So he had mates, he had entertainment. Again, the two water bottles and the rats with mates and entertainment went for the water without the mm, hallucinogens. The and he, you know, the overarching theory is, you know, it depends on what cage you're in. And I think for many people, emotional cages are something that sometimes a child can construct for themselves without the parent knowing. Mm. Sometimes trauma will do it because with the with the trauma without um, denial is often like a cage, and I always sort of think that denial is like a tourniquet on a wound. 
and just blinkering and just getting getting on with it and buckling up and not crying and keeping yourself contained and that can be a cage. And again, I often say to people, the heart doesn't wear a watch. You weren't ready to grieve until the right people are around you. And mm. I've got a client just at the moment, you know, his father is suicided and the mother's concerned that in his adolescence, he's not grieving. He's not ready. Mm. You know, maybe when he becomes a dad, maybe when, you know, he's got his head in the lap of a great love that he'll let it go. But there's there's a ripening and a timing. And I don't think you can force people to do that if they're not ready. But Getting back to the cages, shame is another cage. Mm. And um, shame isolates you. Mm. And I think the vulnerability is all about showing people we love that I want to show you my shame cage and I hope that you love me enough to, you know, to that I can actually show you. And that beautiful saying, if you can't love me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. Yeah. And I think we, um, like we've spoken again about... Um, Brene Brown and her mm. stuff with the vulnerability and shame and you and I have had many conversations about shame and, you know, it, 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 you've just got to be, you've got to be comfortable with, with who you are. You've got to be comfortable, you know, and not, you know, it's, 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 much, it's way easier said than done and I, I think for me one thing I probably struggled with for a while was I, I was trying to be somebody that deep down maybe I wasn't. And I was afraid to let people see what I really was. And we get back to the gladiator and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's that's really important. And I, I can't stress it enough. You know, I've, well, I'm, I'm involved with, you know, I have a lot of gladiators and alpha males and all that. Like I, I spend time with professional martial artists and fighters and all that sort of thing. And Dare I say it, the ones who are the best at what they do in that regard are the ones that aren't afraid to make themselves vulnerable, put themselves out there and always keep, you know, keep learning. The ones who start to slowly slip away are the ones who put up the armour too much, put up the walls, and then slowly they just start to work themselves out because there is just that lack of vulnerability and then it translates into probably a little bit of shame it's very it's very hard and again you know I, I grew up in you know I grew up in a country town you know it was it was an awesome place but you know I think back to my grandfather you know he served in World War II he lost an arm in World War II and looking back now and I've had this conversation with my mother you know he self-medicated and, you know, would go down to the bowls club and do that sort of thing. Back then it would be interpreted as something completely different. He had PTSD mm, well God, yeah. well and truly. You don't get your arm blown off and, not, <laughs> and just be casually whistling your way through Dixieland. And, but, again, for us, he was, he was just, to me, he was just a god. Like he did everything and it was his right arm. So he completely himself retrained himself. He wrote left-handed drove his car, did everything, he built stuff, did everything. And I, I guess, you know, he taught me how to box. That was my first introduction. With one hand. Well, he was a boxing champion in World War Two. You know, he was wow. a PT instructor. So he um he taught me how to box and then it's like you're modeling yourself off him. So I think it's important, like you said about our children, if our children ultimately are going to model themselves off us. So we can either choose to be something that they don't ever want to be or we can get them to see that there is so many pieces to the puzzle. Like my kids know when I'm having a bad day mm. and I I definitely won't hide it. And when I say won't hide it, you know, I'll, I'll lose it with them a bit or you know, my eldest in particular, it'll be a little code word, Dad, are you tired today? Yeah, mate, I'm tired today. Mm. And I think it's good that they they recognise and and I can recognise, you know, and they, again, by doing that, they're not afraid to talk to us because the last thing I want when they get older 
is that they're going to hide stuff from us, you know. And I think the more we flaunt our flaws with the kids, our, our kids don't need us to be perfect. They just need us to be authentic. Mm. I really believe that. And I think, you know, great parenting is on some days being a shining example and on other days being a bloody good warning because mm. kids need to learn. Our kids will, ch- and, you know, we're an evolutionary species. Hopefully our kids will look through our life and go, well, I ain't doing that shit. She mm. stuffed that up. Dad got that wrong. Mum just really dropped the ball there. However, I'm going to cherry pick because I like the way she, he or she did A, B and C. And I think as long as we're open with our flaws and always open to apologise and, and that our kids know they can come to us, they can get angry, they can be, get sad, they can have that whole rainbow of emotions. And, you know, in, in practising that kind of level of emotional fitness, they then don't set themselves up with undue pressure when they become parents because they know hopefully their children are going to cherry pick from their best and worst, but, you know, also keep evolving. We want our children to be smarter and more evolved than we are, mm. you know, and I think that's um, that's where a lot of parents just give themselves undue, undue um, stress. It's not about being perfect, you know, stuffing up and getting yeah. up again is, is important for them to see. Oh, we're far from perfect. I mean, I, I, um, I, I keep, while we're talking, I, I keep thinking of, so yesterday my youngest daughter is unpacking the dishwasher and I've got one of those keep cup coffee cups and it's my it's my go-to. I, I love that thing. She has gone to take it out of the dishwasher. It has slipped out of her hand. It's a glass one and it is just smashed. The first thing that pops out of her head, out of her mouth is, Dad, Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And just, so she's straight away, ah. as she's doing that, her, you know, a bit has flung up and hit her finger and she's bleeding. And it's just, I look back now and I'm not trying to paint that, you know, a couple of years ago I would have, you know, I was just a, an asshole. But there would have been a time where maybe I would have gone, oh, I can't believe you did that, mum. Mate, you, your finger's bleeding. You know, let's, let's go and fix this up. You know, so I think it's, and again, she sort of went, you know, I didn't want to get in trouble. Mm. But I, I want her, and there's been a couple of instances with my youngest in particular like she came to us um, and told us that she had been sent to the, the positive thinking room, which, which you know, which doesn't surprise me with her. And then she's only actually the positive gone, thinking room. Now that's a room at school I never yeah, heard about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I just you know, and I heard about the I, principal's office. And then when I said when I was going to primary school, it was the cuts, and they were, <clears throat> so yeah, the positive thinking room is quite a quite tame. But she she was up front and had that conversation. Yeah. So. I think it's, you know, dare I say it, it's working in that, you know, because it's not to say that, you know, I, I there was stuff I ever hid from my mother, but I definitely thought twice about Flaunting your flaws. Yeah, and I definitely, you know, in my previous job, like if there was mistakes or we missed something, it was just like, oh, if I do this, there's going to be really bad repercussions, so... I think it's, you know, if, if you can, again, you let them know that you're you're disappointed or you let them know that, you know, that's not what needs to happen. But, yeah, the way she um, hurt her finger yesterday, you know, I won't get into the fact that by the end of it it was a little finger and it had strapping tape and a bandage and I'm like, God, it's, it's like she just had an arm amputated. But um, it was the fact that, you know, for me, I, I really took note of that because, you know, it was, yep, yeah, it was precious or whatever, but I was just saying, mate, it's just a coffee cup. Mm. You know, the fact is she went, I'm so sorry. So, yeah, for me that's something that sticks with me now and I guess like working with you, I have little um, little milestones that something will happen and, you know, and again with my wife as well, there'll be just something and I'll go and I'll, I'll want to sort of say to her and I will say to her sometimes, Two years ago, I would have just, you know, that wouldn't happen. Or, you know, but I just sort of thought, hmm, no, no, that's cool. Mm. You know, I, I definitely, I think as gladiators, we, you know, take ourselves far too seriously. Mm. Um, and I, you know, like I said, you, you'd get hung up over the slightest thing. There is a lot more now that I am just willing to just let go. Mm. Or at least, you know, like, you know, you take the breath, walk away, 
go do something and maybe then go and answer that email. Mm. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I guess to stress it, it's it's okay to not have that armour up all the time. I, I still am not used to you calling me a gladiator. I don't think I'm... Well, I, I'm sorry it's such a bloody archetype. But <laughs> no, I, I suppose it is, but it's, it's like... Word. It's just something I observe, well, it's you true, know. true, but you it know, is true. It, yeah, if you, you know? if you look at if you look at myths and fables, if you have a look before we had psychiatry and psychology, they used archetypes and storytelling, hmm. which is what we love about the Game of Thrones, which is what you know. And there's usually a gladiator, and there's a hunter, and there's a fisherman, and there's a bean counter, and there's yeah. a scribe, and there's a comedian, and you know, and there's you know, and you look at any great storyline, you've got those different archetypes. And I would certainly argue that those archetypes are within us all. I certainly have been a warrior woman and a gladiator. And I think that there are dimensions of the psyche and almost channels that we need to go to from time mm. to time because life is multifaceted and we need to be at, you know, regardless of your gender, you need to be able to stand up, speak up and fucking go. Some things are worth fighting for. Mm. You know, you, you wound my child or, and I will fight to the death happily. But if you break a piece of fine china in my house, and, you know, I love fine china, it's, it's a cup. You know, and I think that's what we're t- kind of talking about. It's there's a there's the um, the priorities, and and uh, you mentioned something earlier. It's the it's the little things, and being a teacher like you are, you know, when I'm working with Olympian athletes, I always say, you know, it's the petty detailed stuff in this emotional work that really matters. Because if you have a look at what couples squabble about. Oh. It's the petty stuff. But in saying that, the difference between good and great is always detail, mm. you know, and you know the difference between a gold medal and a bronze medal is detail mm. and how well that teacher helped them, whether we're buying a pair of shoes or eating a great meal, it's the detail, it's the care in the detail. And, you know, our loved ones notice those detailed things where we used to lose our temper, we used to be an asshole, mm. we used to um, disconnect they notice those details and that is what intimacy is. It's the details that somebody close to you takes the time with how you like your tea, with how you like your Vegemite toast buttered, with how you like to be kissed, mm. with how how you argue even. You know, everybody argues. If you're not arguing, you're not resolving and evolving through conflict, mm. but arguing and fighting are two different things. And I think, you know... When I call you a gladiator, I spot one, you've got one. I've got a gladiator in me as well. And I, I think being on one channel doesn't serve anybody well. You know, we've no. got people, I have clients that come to me and they can buddy meditate until they levitate. They're so fucking zen. They're into mm. their feminine and that's wonderful. But they can't pay a bill. They can't provide and protect for themselves or speak up or resolve conflict. Yeah. You know, they spend their life running away to retreats because they can't have the hard conversation with their kids or their lover. Well, I mean... I- I totally get it, and I, I think for me, I was, I was very lopsided. And again, even from a business point of view, you know, like as as we've spoken, I would physically be on my game all the time, but then you know, <laughs> finances crap, business crap, this crap. Forget that. I can do this physically. You, you're not listening. I got, I got this. I can do this. And I mean. We've had conversations like about, I'm, I'm sure, some of the professional athletes mm. that you've, you know, that you work with. One day, you're one of them, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that you're awkward about that now. I mean, oh, you travel just... the world teaching people martial arts. You run one of the most successful schools in Brisbane. I, I guess, I don't know. You don't see yourself that way. I, I'm more comfortable. But see, I'm more comfortable seeing myself that way. But as we've said, I think there was maybe a point in my life Mm. where I was seeing myself that way and it was a detrimental effect. Yes, yeah. But I think these days I'm just... You're both. Yeah, I'm more comfortable being me. But, yeah, like, you know, with professional athletes, you know, one day they're at the top of the tree and, you know, like we see it in the media all the time, the following week, month later, we're like, wow. And, again, I really... There, there would be that people out there that would straight away jump to the negative, but I, I go, man, I really, I really feel for that person because everything that they had that basically felt they held them together, it's gone, mm. and now they go, what do I do now? So I think I really these days, I know that I can't physically do what I do for the rest of my life. 
but I can mentally do what I can do for the rest of my life. And that's what's really working on me at the moment. You know, and I keep, you know, I always use that term, you know, just you want to leave a footprint, you know, you want to have a little bit of a legacy to leave. And I definitely, I look for so much more in martial arts these days than just how many rounds can I do on that sort of thing. And there's still tests that I want to do to myself and to make sure that I'm not in the box just yet. But I definitely look more at martial arts as a, um, and even just professional sport, like there's so much more up here in professional sport. You know, anyone, if they really, if you trained anybody, they could run a marathon or whatever, but it's whether or not they could, you know, do it again and again and again and again. Mm. So that's the way I look at it now. It's interesting you said earlier about the one, the people that burn out, the emotionally unfit ones mm. do burn out. We know that um, because often behind closed doors when they go home with the gold medal around their neck, they're emotionally bankrupt because mm. it's all about doing, you know, the doing and not about the becoming. You know, if you're becoming an asshole while you're doing it, when you can, when you stop doing it because life has many chapters and, and as we know as we get older – you know, the physical, you know, our hormones, our, our, our youth, our looks, our, our breeding years, if you would say, you know, mm. in the first half of your life, in the second half of your life, you need to evolve past that. Yeah. And if you've, if you've become an asshole while you're doing all of that, the second half for many people is a crisis. What I am also interested in just unpacking a little bit with you is we talked about, you talked about earlier about, um, you know, your grandfather emotionally mm. medicating. And, and I too, for those watching this that have never seen me before, I'm a recovering drug addict alcoholic and I've been clean and sober 24 years. But not everybody is alcoholic that emotionally medicates and takes drugs. And some people, emotional medicating being what we do to emotionally disconnect when we're not on, mm. you know, when you come home and behind closed doors. So some people overeat, some people it's cocaine, heroin, marijuana, pills, booze, Porn, sex addiction, mm. spending, gambling. Do you, um, because, you know, they don't want to feel. And if without the emotional muscle, you can feel like a failure if you can, you're out there kicking goals and, you know, winning grand finals and gold medals and you're a hero. And as you said, I can do this, but who I'm becoming at, at home, I'm unable to connect. And often people do feel like a failure. And I always say to them, it's emotional fitness is like physical fitness. It's not, it's not exclusive. You can train and learn and it's never too late. So do you identify with chapters in your life where you feel like you were disconnecting? Yeah, I am. Um most definitely and I, I think it's it's funny like you said um the whole you know like I, I stand I stand on a martial arts mat or I teach a class or a seminar and for that for that moment I am you know I'm in control and dare I say it, like I'm in charge and people are looking up to me and you know you have that I hate using the word but you have that power and you have that authority but then the second you walk off the mat, you know, sometimes you do feel like, you know, the relationship my wife and I have is, is funny. Like, and people will even look and go, you know, I'll, I'll be on here doing all these commands and then I'll walk off and, you know, well, these days in the middle of a class and my wife picks up my kids, when, you know, on her way home because at the shed, you know, I'll give her a hug and a kiss and, or, you know, I'll walk over and she'll give me a bit of shit for something or whatever and they go, you know, it's all... It's, it's okay, you know. I, I think we've had this conversation numerous times, um, and the first thing that popped up was um, my backing the trailer, the bloke backing the trailer stuff, you know. And this is where I think the big work for me is that it's okay, like you don't have to be good at everything, and if you're a gladiator, you know all this sort of stuff it's okay to still be, you know, shit at stuff. So, you know, I can, I think I can, you know, I can teach well. Um, I would like to think I can protect well. I was very good at my job in my old career. Um, I can, I think, hold my own fighting and everything like that. But you put me under the bonnet of a car or you put me to try and reverse the caravan that we own, oh, man, it's, I'm, and the sure as shit my wife and I will have a blue. But the big thing that got me there is, like you said, about, like, my father, 
My father raced cars. He was an A-grade mechanic. He had all these things. He could strip cars down, put them back together again, and I get nervous changing the tyre. So for all that, you know, as we've spoken mm-hmm. about, there's that time where you go, you know, I'm Graham Reba's son. I should be able to do this. Now I'm like, I'm Graham Reba's son and I can't do it. And I just, it's not that I don't care. It's just. It's not your skill set. If, if I've got a mate sitting beside me and he goes, do you want me to have a go back in it? Fucking go for your life, mate. It's all you. Mm. I, I just understand now that you just can't be good at everything. Mm. And the amount, like I, you know, the amount of martial arts that I do, that's why, like, you know, if I'm, you know, we go over to Thailand once a year to train. If I'm just, you know, I just go over there now and I'm just, I'm just happy being there. I don't go over there and go, I've got to, I've got to really push. I've got to really be the best. If I want to miss a session and just go for a walk and just have a coffee somewhere, then I will. Yeah. These days, it's just not. You know, I understand that there's big picture stuff. You know, it's it's not as important to me anymore. Martial arts will always be a part of my life. I I I can't see it stopping anytime soon. But my family is also mm. a really big part of my life these days. Mm. It's Be- just making the spread. Yeah, beautiful. Um, you said something earlier that just twigged a question that I wanted to ask you. I had a client here the other day and, and her daughter um, is very high intellect, a very kind of gifted girl, and she's, she said, you know, I'm having real trouble getting her to play team sports and this, mm-hmm. that and the other, and this is just my take, and I'd be interested in your view. I'm a more introverted temperament, and if I'm going to do, I hate team sports. I like to watch them. And my husband, who's an extrovert, you know, he loves to be in a rowing squad and to do this, yeah. this, that and the other. He played rugby for years. For me... If I'm going to exercise, I, I remember once I joined a running club, I, I'll run and walk. And I remember at this running club, people wanted to talk to me while I was running. I was like, fuck off, I'm here to run. Yeah. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want yeah. to make friends. And I think you said something interesting about um, you tried team sports and it wasn't for you. And and I, I do think, you know, along the temperament scale, there are people that lean more into, into introversion and being self-supporting and self-starting. It's not about being rude or not caring about a team or wanting to ever collaborate, but I work best um under my own steam. I, I, I'm happy to observe a team, but I don't want to be a part of I'd rather stick needles in my eyes. Mm. And I, I, I'm interested, do you find a more introverted temperament wants to do martial arts or is, is that just not relevant? No, no, I think it is relevant. And I think the big thing for us in our, probably the first answer to that, where I, like our shed and where I teach, um, our facility, we're very big on community. So I will have this saying that I will say to people, martial arts effectively is a team sport because it's it's part of the community that you're getting involved in. But to answer your question probably better, I think there is a certain, um, the people that come and do martial arts, there's two types. There's the person that comes in and we will have one at least, you know, one every month walks in. I want to be the next UFC champion. I want to fight in the ring. I want to do this, this, and this, and this. Those people generally last a couple of weeks and they go. Um, I always have a saying that I say to my guys, um, and I say it at the shed, assholes don't last long here. And it's not the fact that we don't, you know, that we beat them up or anything. They just don't fit in. What I've found in martial arts in the last probably 10 years in particular the demographic doing martial arts has completely backflipped. So when I started martial arts, you know, as a teenager, we were all the same age and we literally did, we went hard on each other every night and it wasn't a good night unless we did go hard on each other. You know, I did a PT with a woman this morning. She's um, one of our mid-level ranks. She's 59 years old. Spring chicken. Yep. She has not played sport for over 20 years before starting martial arts eight months ago. And it is just empowering her. Yeah. That's, to me, that's the sort of people that we're getting more into martial arts these days. Um, and I think it's good because they're learning that, you know, 
and I do agree, and it's nothing against, like I said, my brother played team sports and he was very good at them. My eldest daughter's playing netball now and she loves it. I do think that sometimes there are those people out there that go, I just, and for me, it wasn't necessarily I didn't like working in a team. I always felt like if I got, you know, because I played soccer when I was really young and if I stuffed up the pass, I'm like, fuck, I just let all you guys down. I'm so sorry. So high expectations of yourself. Yeah. And I think um, people who, you know, we seem to get people doing in martial arts, they can put the pressure on themselves. Um, it is hard sometimes because we try and give them that nudge to see what they're truly capable of, the same as in a, in a team environment. But um, again, stuff I've read, you know, like team sports and also like the community of a single single sport is still that that push that we want to, you know, we're trying Tap your to potential. just see what you actually can yeah, do. Like yeah. we have, you know, I've told you some of the success stories that we have, like, you know, 10-year-old girl that so timid she would hardly speak, ends up being a, a school prefect, goes and fights in Thailand, you know, Another girl, again, really timid, you know, quietly spoken teenager. Got to watch the quiet ones. Yeah, oh, yeah. Now Still, she's, still again, waters run deep. I know. She won a state title for kickboxing and now she's on a second placement as a, as a police officer wow. in, in regional Queensland. Yeah. And I think that's the stuff that, you know, I think that's good. I yeah. think there is so much more and I think the public's getting more clued up that martial arts is a lot more than just the punching and kicking and mm. the violence. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, especially our karate class these days, on any given night it can be 60% female. I love that. Oh, 10, 15 years ago that would not have happened. You know, I think it's interesting, and you know, you being a, a father of daughters, you know, that I, I, my, my client base used to be probably 80% female mm. now, it's probably 55% male. Mm. It's interesting how those things swing. Mm. I suppose just before we finish up, Kyle, there's one thing I would like to ask you. You said a beautiful word earlier, which I love, and you, you mentioned leaving a footprint and a mm. legacy. And, and I suppose um, actually before we get to that, mm. aren't you doing a challenge for your birthday? Yeah. <laughs> because maybe we'll do in series two, we might come back and talk about that. Okay. Um, yes, I am. I had an idea. So I turned 44 in August. Um, and even though all the talk we've had about balancing out the emotional and the physical, I still would like to know that I'm not in the box just yet. Which box? Like a coffin. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so the cameraman's laughing. Um, so I'm, um, I'm doing what I call the 44 for 44. So it's, um, 44 three-minute rounds. Um, so there'll be sparring, so stand-up sparring, um, jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai clinching um, with, like, knees and elbows and just pad work. Um, I'm nodding, pretending I know what that is, but I don't. It's going to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> the guys are calling it the Iron Man. Um, the Iron Man. The CMA Iron Man. So I think um, it's just a little thing just, you know, and it's not going to be full on, you know, it's it's just a bit of fun, just a goal for me. And again, I keep using that influence over authority. I love that. Influence over authority. You know, yeah. just it's it's not trying to prove anything to anyone. Um, you know, like I've invited I've I'm having the joke saying, you know, I'm not allowed to have a birthday party, so this is the best I can do. You know, I'm getting a keg on for the guys. I'll get a, a food. You'll truck. do some footage. You film some footage. Yeah, we'll film and um, we'll do all that sort of thing. Like I'm doing rounds with my kids. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've got some old mates that I still keep in touch with. Yeah. You know, I said, can you come and do a round with me? And they all say, can we do them right at the end when you're the most tired? I said, whatever, mate. Someone's someone's got to do the first round with me. But um, yeah, it'll it'll be a good thing. Just to, you know, my idea is that. I do 44, then I do one more um, each year um, until I do 50 for 50. All right. So maybe you might come back in Series 2 and we might be able to yeah. put a bit of that footage through. Yeah. and, and well, I'll let you know what hospital yeah. I'm in and recovering so you yeah. can come and visit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but footprint and legacy, what yeah. you know, what, what would you feel that you would like, you know, just sitting here as a young 43-year-old man, mm. 
what do you feel um, you would like for your legacy to be for your students, you know, your, your daughters, your wife, your footprint? Cue awkward silence. Um, I, I want my kids to know that it's okay to fail. Um, it's, I want my students to know that it's okay to fuck shit up. Um, I think the, the footprint that I want to leave is that, you know, I, I, I used to call it the, um, I used to call it the hit by the bus theory. You know, if, if I was to die tomorrow or get hit by a bus, um, Chikara martial arts or whatever, that would still function. It would have to function. And so I'm, I'm trying to now, you know, it's, it's to make people self-sufficient. I want, I want that just, it's such a hard question to answer. I just want people to realise what they can really do. I think. Um, well, you've got a slogan you use a lot, back yourself. Back yourself. I love that one. Yeah, and I guess that's essentially one learn to back themselves. Yeah. Like you said before about like my, um, you know, you were calling me a professional athlete and I don't think I'm anything, but but I think it's the humility of, um, you know, I think I've still got a lot to do. Um, I am a kid that grew up in a country town with a single mum who worked her fucking ass off mm. to provide, I think I'm doing okay. I have made plenty of mistakes along the way. Um, and I think you've, like you said before, it's okay to make those mistakes, um, but you have to keep backing yourself. You know, there's, I'm sure you're the same. I, I think a lot of us are the same. If you were to put that crystal ball out, and look at where you were 20 years ago to here, you go, that's that's not even possible. You know, mm. like I I remember watching the karate kid in 19, what was it, 84, and seeing that, you know, the Cobra Kai had a, a full time, full time dojo, like a full time center. And I went, oh man, how cool would that be to do martial arts? And now here we are. And I mean it's I just got to chill then. <laughs> you live in the dream. It is. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's a nightmare, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it's fun, and I I guess I want I want that to keep going, hmm. you know. And I have, you know, and I guess it's probably from you know maybe being around death a little bit and knowing nothing hmm. lasts forever. I have in my head who my successes are going to be. Hmm. Um. And I guess it's just trying to, you know, like your kids, your kids see what you're doing, you know, like I um, I hope that, you know, and again, my one dream is that I live longer for my kids than my father was able to yeah. live. It's just seeing that they're, you know, you know, when you sort of, you'd, you'd see kids saying, you know, which one's your dad? You know, you're trying not to sort of, you know, that's my dad. Yeah, to be proud. You know, yeah. and it's. It's funny, I um It's a big call to get your kids to be proud of you. It is. <laughs> you gotta it earn is. that. They won't give it away freely. Well, a very, <laughs> very quick story. My um my eldest daughter had her netball team season photos last week and I was the one who went and took her there. And we walked in and she goes, Okay, you wait here. <laughs> I've and got off. that all through adolescence. <laughs> Mum, I'm not kissing you as I'm getting out the car. And off she goes. And I just I went that's all right. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I th and I think you know that's that's a thing that I just want to leave. I just want I want to leave something that you know people will be proud of. And yeah. like you know we've we've had um we've had discussions before about when you hear obituaries at yeah. funerals. Yeah. You know, so eulogies. They'll you know you've never heard a eulogy about someone. Yeah, he was a complete arsehole. You know. Yeah. I'm I'm happy for people to say that. I did this wrong, but I also did all this shit right. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, oh. that's about me. Thank you, young man. I look forward to coming and talking to you after you've done your 44. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Just make sure you got wheelchair access yeah, yeah. for that day. <laughs> Thank you, darling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for watching. Bye. Bye. <laughs>